So uh, about a year ago, I became the 10th person to walk around the world, and my dog, Savannah, became the first dog to do so. Over seven years, I walked 28,000 miles across 38 countries. After I finished, I had interviews at all the big abbreviations, CNN, BBC, GMA, and in these interviews, I'd always get asked, wasn't it difficult? Didn't you want to throw in the towel? And after taking a moment while I considered answering nonchalantly, I would answer honestly and say, yeah, it was difficult. There were times it was awful. In Mexico, I walked through a downpour for four straight days. In Costa Rica, it was so hot, the soles of my shoes melted. But did I ever consider throwing in the towel? Not really. In my mind, there was nowhere else I could be. You see, when I was 17, my friend Anne-Marie passed, and her passing forced me to consider what I valued and what I wanted out of life. I reflected on this for about six months and ultimately came to the answer that I wanted to travel, to be forced into adventure, and to understand the world. I, ref I reflected on this, and ultimately I searched the internet for different ways to travel. I scoured blog post after blog post and was drawn to stories of big adventures, people selling their things and backpacking Europe or unmooring their boat and sailing the Americas. I wanted to do it all, I wanted to see it all, and I wanted to leave immediately. The problem was I was broke. I had no money. I had $1,000 in my bank account. And because I had signed an early acceptance to college, in four years I would have a mountain of student loans to pay off as well. So with this constraint recognized and begrudgingly accepted, I tweaked my search from ways to travel to cheap ways to travel. This refined search led me to Steve Newman and Carl Bushby, two men who had walked around the world. And once I saw that was possible, I knew right away a walk around the world fulfilled everything I wanted out of life, travel, adventure, understanding. Eight years passed before I was able to take my first step, and in those eight years, the world changed a lot. No longer did we need to scour blog post after blog post to find different ways to travel. Each day, at the brush of a thumb, we can be inundated with a thousand different lifestyles. It's Amazing, but it's led me to wonder if I had been able to see so much with the brush of a thumb when I was 17, if I would have been so resolute in my dream of walking around the world. Part of me thinks I would have been overwhelmed. There's an idea you may already be familiar with known as the paradox of choice. It says the more choices we have, the less satisfied we are with our eventual decision. It's why people in New York stay single for so long and why people in rural parts of the country get married relatively quickly. It's why people love Costco. There are good deals and quality products, of course, but there's also less choice. At a subconscious level, we love this. Too many choices is unsettling. We live in an age of remarkable abundance, yet according to the World Happiness Report, American happiness peaked in 1989, and American high schoolers' happiness peaked in 2007, right when the iPhone was released. Having infinite possibilities isn't a guarantee of more happiness and more productivity. More often than not, it leads to anxiety, inaction, and dissatisfaction. And having endless possibilities isn't only a problem for individuals, companies suffer from it as well. Rather than knowing exactly who they are and what they value, many companies thoughtlessly bleed into new ventures in search of growth, expanding their menu, diluting their brand. Rather than innovating to create sustained values, companies set broad goals which lead nowhere but the status quo. But there's a way to force innovation, and there's a way to be happier. There is a way to be more focused, to see obstacle as opportunity, and a way to tap into your untapped creativity. This is the circle of possibility. Within the circle is everything you could become. Towards the edge are the limits of your possibility. Michelin star chef, Pulitzer Prize winning author, National Geographic photographer. As time progresses, most of us probe different directions. After all, the world is interesting, and with so many things we could be, how can we be just one? When my friend Emery died, she taught me a harsh lesson. It's a lesson all the most productive people understand intuitively. And though the consequence of this lesson goes by different names, passion, obsession, perseverance, all those characteristics stem from something more fundamental. The acceptance that we, as humans, are small. That our time and our attention is limited. 
The world is too complex and too vast for us to do everything. And so the great thinkers know in order to make the most of life, you have to embrace constraints on it. The phrase embrace constraints contains a lot of latitude. At its broadest, it means knowing yourself, deciding what you want out of life, then refusing to accept anything else. For me, that meant finding a way to travel, to be forced into adventure and understand the world. For the most valuable company in the world, it means knowing you're a personal computer company, then focusing on the details of that with such intensity that your user ecosystem becomes known as a walled garden. Love it or hate it, a garden is a nice place to be. At its narrowest, embracing constraints means finding your weakness and locking yourself in with it. Think of how a bodybuilder can see a certain muscle needs bulking so they put it under stress. Think of how Steph Curry uses strobe glasses to improve his vision and reaction time on the court. Or think of Google and how one of their main principles to guide innovation is creativity loves constraints. Without constraints, we leak to the path of least resistance. But constraints demand focus. They demand creative problem solving, and they demand the acceptance of obstacles. To illustrate just how powerful constraints can be, especially over a long time frame, I want to tell you about a kite festival in Jaipur, India. The kite festival isn't one where there are minions and Spider-Men soaring overhead. The Jaipur kite festival is more like a thousand small battles. It's not uncommon to cover kite string in manja, a fine glass powder, then attempt to time a tug just right so you cut the string of a neighboring kite. All these battles overhead make for an amazing scene, but it leads to some unintended consequences. While I was there, I paused at a medical tent where people were constantly bringing in new patients. What surprised me about the tent wasn't that it had been set up, it was that the patients were pigeons. When I asked one of the workers why they had set up a medical center to treat pigeons, he replied that he and the other workers were Jan, and in their religion they have a saint who sacrificed himself for the life of a dove. He was referring to a story from the Mahabharata, one of Hindu's two great epics. In it, a king is sitting on his palace terrace when a dove lands on his lap and asks for his protection, which the king grants. A moment later, a hawk arrives and asks the king for his lunch, the dove. The king says he can't allow this, and so the hawk says, well, where am I supposed to get my lunch? The king knows he can't just send the hawk to a butcher because that would only mean sacrificing one innocent life for another, and so instead, the king offers himself to the hawk. And in doing so, the two birds reveal themselves as gods and praise the king's goodness. This parable is emblematic of just how critical a tenant nonviolence is to Jainism. Nonviolence runs so deep in Jainism that nearly all Jains are vegetarian, and roughly 65% of Jains abstain from eating even root vegetables because that would mean killing a plant. How does this tenant, this constraint of nonviolence, affect a population throughout history? Well, what profession could a Jan have 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or today? They can't be butchers, they can't be fishermen, they couldn't work in a tannery. The professions they could have, teacher, merchant, doctor. Surely, the quickest way to make a living for many Jans throughout history would have been to become a butcher or a fisherman, but under the constraint of nonviolence, they had to find a different, more challenging solution. The result? According to the Pew Research Center, the Jan population has India's highest literacy rate and highest rate of secondary education. But beyond that, 75% of Jans occupy the top 20% of India's income distribution. 75%. That's remarkable. And this is not to say that by adopting nonviolence, you or your ancestors will reach the top quintile of income distribution. But nonviolence in Jainism illustrates an idea taken to the extreme, the idea that over time, if applied correctly, constraints lead to incredible growth. But how do we do this? How do we apply constraints to force growth and innovation? When I was in Barcelona, getting one of the best haircuts I've ever had and have never been able to replicate, I was amazed at how peaceful it was as an experience. Outside was a piazza, and coming through the doorway were sounds of people talking, children laughing, even birds singing. And as I took all this in, it occurred to me I was looking at something I had never seen before, a simple solution to problems that plague almost every city, a solution I later realized that the city council arrived at and was able to implement because they could answer two questions. What do I value, and where do I want to end up? 
In 2015, the City Council of Barcelona knew where they wanted to end up. They wanted to reduce CO2 emissions and increase green space. Those output constraints, those results they were seeking, led to research which found the primary hindrance to reduce CO2 emissions and increase green space was an overdependence on cars. Cars were the greatest emitter of CO2, and other than apartments, the greatest use of land. The input constraints, the resource constraints that Barcelona had were many. Existing infrastructure, limited funds, the time pressure of climate commitments. But just as I found a creative solution to traveling because I was broke, Barcelona found a creative solution because of their constraints, not despite them. Barcelona is laid out like a grid. And because it's a grid, each block is an island surrounded by straightaway roads. The innovation the city council came up with, which took advantage of their existing infrastructure, was to create super blocks. Three by three sections of the city that could be closed to non-essential car use. Rather than allowing every street to become a highway, the streets inside super blocks are closed to through traffic, they have a speed limit of six miles per hour, and drivers are forced to turn at each junction. The result of this simple, easy to implement solution has been less pollution, less noise, safer streets, and an added 56 acres of green space citywide. Not to mention cooler streets, increased property value, and very peaceful haircuts. Both input and output constraints led the city council to the idea of super blocks, but the implication of super blocks was only feasible because the constraints they placed on themselves were put there according to the city's deeper values. They wanted to be a clean, pedestrian-friendly city. They valued it. That matters. When constraints are demanding, they can't be arbitrary or they won't last. Barcelona asked those two questions, what do I value and where do I want to end up? It may seem overly simple, but you have to remember with what fundamental understanding those two questions are being asked from. The understanding that just like you and me, a city cannot be everything. It can't be both pedestrian friendly and an endless highway. Just like a company, if a city grows without constraints based in its values, it will take the path of least resistance. The best solutions may present themselves, but without value-based constraints, the best solutions will never be reached because the constraints will give way the moment they become uncomfortable. And constraints drive growth due to the fact that they don't let you off easy. I experienced this myself. While I was walking around the world, the hobby that best fit into living out of a baby carriage and walking eight hours a day was photography. Initially, it was a hobby of necessity, but as time went on, my interest was piqued, and so I looked to social media to see what it meant to be a successful photographer. And what I found was successful on Instagram, besides girls in bikinis and dogs, were photographs of mountains, and usually a little silhouette of a human for scale. At the time, Instagram was all I knew of the photography world, so I thought to be a successful photographer, I had to take Instagram-y photos. The problem was I was rarely at a mountain. More often than not, I was passing through some modest village. For a while, this drove me crazy. It drove me crazy that I couldn't take the types of photographs I wanted to. But as it turned out, the constraint of not being able to drive from one photogenic location to another was exactly what I needed to grow. Because I had no other option, and because I wanted to end up as a successful photographer, not just an Instagrammer, I had to find beautiful photographs wherever I was. And that meant learning to photograph everything, not just mountains, but architecture, portraits, landscapes. I said earlier the phrase, embrace constraints, contains a lot of latitude. They can be used for narrow effect, like improving your vision because you want to be a better basketball player, or for broad effect, like forcing a company to continually grow and innovate in an area of expertise. But beyond the power of constraints to drive growth and creativity, embracing constraints is an amazing way to change the perception of obstacles. Once you understand that constraints aren't inherently bad, not only do you begin to search for constraints which will help you grow, but you learn to accept the constraints that are beyond your control. I had the dream of walking around the world at 17. I didn't take my first step until I was 26. I went to school, then worked two, sometimes three jobs at a time to pay off my loans. Then, once I did begin the walk, it took me seven years to do the thing. The world walk dominated my life for 16 years. 
but I was able to persevere because I constrained my life to an idea built according to my values. And I was able to stay focused because when you know what you value, you know what you can do without. So what do you value? Where do you want to end up? Where do you draw the line, and how strong will that line be? You have to remember, you can't be everything. But if you apply the right constraints, you can be something. Thank you. <laughs>